Welcome back to the ATI Podcast. Barrett here. Going to be flying solo here today for the ATI Podcast. Doing some recording here by myself, which of course means solo. Uh, now, Josh is not with me today. Uh, Josh has got some other family matters to attend to, as well as uh, you know our other usual compatriots that are assisting us with the show are all kind of tied up with some other family plans. So no worries. Going to be flying things solo today. Going to be talking about a few different things with Jay Coast, our guest this week. We're really excited to have Jay Coast. First discovered Jay Coast through the punk rock flea market specifically, at least we did. Um, immediately heard his music and, and immediately gravitated towards. I'm a R&B rap hip hop artist fan uh, myself. I've uh, always been exposed to and been around that type of music in my entire life. It's been part of my life. Had friends that's went on to pursue those things. Anybody that's been with us here on the show long enough and watched some of our prior episodes is probably just aware of that in general conversation or some of my music selections or uh, in particular in my conversation that I had with Jesus Rose, a.k.a. Jones Boy, or formerly known as Jones Boy, I should say. Uh, Brian Jones, my old childhood friend from Arcadia Valley, a uh, very fantastic artist out on the West Coast doing his thing. Now he's doing college tours and everything. So hopefully coming to a city near you. So make sure you guys are still following him. If you haven't started following him, follow him. But back to our conversation today with Jay Coast. Jay Coast, very talented guy himself. Uh, I think we're going to learn about kind of his eclectic background in music and his upbringing that's going to make him and his talents and his music specifically stand out to everybody a little bit more musical arrangements in particular uh, that are being infused into his music. The fact that he doesn't stick to just one lane or genre specifically. I think a lot of folks are going to really gravitate towards the variety that he brings as well. And everybody knows that listens to our show. I, myself, our team is a big fan of variety. And so it's just kind of like multiple layer awesomeness and what we're presenting for folks today. Wanted to talk about a few current events topics real quickly before I welcome in Jay Coast. Uh, specifically, no bigger news right now, at least in American pop culture and entertainment, and that is what's going on at the box office with Barbenheimer. So, cultural phenomenon, a lot of folks are going into Barbenheimer, the double screening of both Barbie and Oppenheimer. Jay Robert. Bob Oppenheimer, of course, the father of the atomic bomb and kind of, you know, early first half of the 19th or, or I should say 1900. So the 20, 20th century, as they say, big in championing and discovering and putting the team together in the right minds behind the atomic bomb and the success of that program, the Manhattan Project, specifically the site that was set up at the T Trinity test site in New Mexico. And uh, the 40 plus man team and their families, man, man and woman team, I should say, and their families that just moved and literally built a city there and uh, really gave Oppenheimer, a guy who's just kind of a beautiful mind in many respects, uh, a purpose. And I think he just kind of got so lost and locked into that world specifically that uh, he's always been kind of a fascinating character in many respects, uh, specifically the fact that. You know, he was a scientist that was applauded and acclaimed, as it, as it were. He's got an eclectic background in teaching, uh, studied over in Germany. He is a descendant of uh, Germany and Jewish specifically, or was, I should say. He's no longer with us. Um, 
a companion piece for Oppenheimer actually released on the Peacock Network on as a universal piece, which is who Nolan did this movie with. Um, Oppenheimer himself, I think, has been a character over history that has been kind of evident that as years went on, especially post the two bombs and Hiroshima and Nagasaki being dropped on Japan, became regretful. Like I think we within like four months of him of the bombs dropping, he was immediately regretful about what they did. I think he was under the impression in guys that literally the whole time he was doing this project, the bombs were literally only going to be dropped on Germany and his fuel to get involved in this to begin with was because he was Jewish himself and he was afraid of the persecution that he, his fellow, fellow Jewish people, his fellow scientists were actually facing in the midst of war. He is been a fascinating character just because you haven't really seen it contextualize kind of the real human element of things um, that he went through and really how could you with uh, with the exception of some footage uh, in in years following you know uh, there's so many odd things that you'll realize with the Oppenheimer story that went on there was like such a fame to him and I think he got kind of caught up in the rock star lifestyle of things as well which seems odd, but it certainly is fact for him. He was kind of a womanizer, heavy drinker, alcoholic, um, chain smoker, a you know, huge partier. He seemed to be well liked, uh, whether that's either, you know, from literal accounts, historical accounts, reports, things that you read, especially in all the events leading up to the discovery of the atomic bomb. He didn't really seem like I think kind of like the only chatterbug about him that was even in of a negative fashion was the fact that he was a womanizer, but it was kind of well known. Eventually it got looked upon uh, unfondly his left leaning political views because it, he kind of went through that McCarthyism and the red scare and uh, things against communism because things immediately, I mean, almost simultaneously where we were already concerned with Russia, but things, the focus shift to Russia once those bombs were dropped on Japan and, war, and that subsequently basically ended World War II, and we went seamlessly and immediately into the Cold War. So a lot of that's depicted. Uh, I'm kind of running in between the documentary and the movie and everything, but it's so easy to do because the movie is very historically accurate on so many things about Oppenheimer, his relationships, the events that took place. It Christopher Nolan is a great director, definitely one of the greatest living directors of our my lifetime. Uh, I think that that was already not up for debate, but this has certainly sealed it. This might be his best movie, and I love a lot of Christopher Nolan movies. You're talking Memento, Inception, the Batman trilogy that he did with Bale. I think people sleep on Insomnia. The following's awesome. Interstellar. Tell me a more beautiful movie than Interstellar. Like, the guy is just balls out amazing. But Oppenheimer? Man. I I don't know what I expected. I expected great because of the cast and Christopher Nolan, but man, phenomenal. My favorite movie this year. I don't know that I'm going to see a better movie, and I can't recommend folks enough to go see Oppenheimer. I caught a 70 millimeter screening with friend of the show from Waxing on himself, Rich Jackson, RJ, and I was very happy to catch that screening with him. And we had a very good time. Three hours flew by. Did not seem like a three-hour movie. I think, I mean, there was even a lot of the younger people in the crowd that I guess I would probably assume, why are they watching this and are they going to pay attention? Nobody had their phones out. Everybody was locked in. You could hear pins drop at, at moments. There's just so many creative things going on with the movie. I mean, Oppenheimer's a historical figure. There's not really anything you can say that would technically, quote-unquote, give away the story. It's not like people are going to be sitting on the edge of their seats and like wondering if we ever dropped the bomb. I think we all know that that happened. Uh, anybody with any remote intelligence knows that or took a few history classes. But how you how they tell the story, you know, I've, I've, always, I've made this comment several different times, and I truly do believe it, and that is the fact that, you know, it's not always the destination that is my concern or that I'm worried about being told, told about from folks. Uh, the how you get there is more so the story. And uh, I, again, it seemed pretty historically accurate to me. The only thing that they didn't dive into that I noticed right away 
there, there's two huge exceptions. The one I will not mention, but the, the, the second is that there's literally no mention of Oppenheimer's first wife that I can remember. You don't see her on screen. You only see his initial, uh, well, we'll say like long lasting love interest, which is the Florence Pugh character. I believe that was Kitty. And it was his on again, off again, um, fiance. And, and I might have them conflicted with their names, but, and then you, the, the only other woman that you see of romantic interest, although there's allusions and assumptions that he's, because he's being flirtatious with other women throughout that he either slept with them or whatever the case is. But um, the only other woman that you see him have a relationship with on screen, that is, that is his uh, wife. That is his second wife that is played by Emily Blunt. And she does a fantastic job acting like almost unrecognizable at times. Like I think somebody asked me like, and I would consider consider like another cinephile that saw a clip and they were like, who is that in that movie? And I was like, that's Emily Blunt. And they're like, are you kidding me? So like she's balls out perform. I mean, she's a good actress anyways, but a lot of the things that she's in, I don't necessarily always watch, um, you know, the, the movies that she did with her husband, the horror movies, um, that just come out here in the last few years. Um, you know, I really enjoyed those two. Uh, you know, she had really great performance in those, especially the second one. She had to kind of take over the lead in that, um, you know, uh, th- those Quiet Place movies, that is. Uh, Quiet Place 2, she was basically the lead in that. I really enjoyed her performance there. I liked her in Edge of Tomorrow. Um, if anybody saw Jungle Cruise, didn't hate it. And she was, you know, prompt. she was the female lead in that. So there's some movies out there that I like of hers, but I'm not, like, knocking down the door to go see the next Emily Blunt movie, typically, personally. She just doesn't usually act in things that I'm, like, remotely in, or very in-depth interested in, I guess we'll put that way. So, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of avenues I could go on and talk about that movie. No question it's going to get a nomination for sound editing. No question it's going to get a nomination for directing. No question it's going to get nominated for cinematography. No question it's going to get nominated for some of the individual acting performances. Goddamn, Robert Downey Jr., another fantastic performance. I mean, one of my favorite actors of all time. But goddamn, what a what what a return to force uh, his performance in this movie! Like, God, I mean, just there's just so many perfor- and not on the screen that much. But Casey Affleck, don't sleep on Casey Affleck's character that's in it very briefly. Talk about being uncomfortable, like the most like heavy handed hits by the least amount of screen time. Like Casey Affleck. It's just the subtleties in his acting and his facial structures and how he talks. Stay tuned in to Casey Affleck specifically. My girl Florence is in it. It's like number one celebrity crush. Definitely, if she's not, she's definitely in the top three. Um, not in it as much as Emily Blunt, but in in it enough to enjoy her fine acting skills. Uh, so let me transition that over to Barbie. So kind of the Barbie piece. I bought my wife and my daughter. Advanced tickets to go see that special showing at the Alamo Draft House and some of the cool events that they had going on there. I think that they thoroughly enjoyed that experience. Um, they had the kind of like props set up in the lobby, pictures, opportunities, special drinks and menus and so on. So the girls kind of had a big girls day out, did some shopping, uh, took some picture in front of Barbie merchandise and did all kinds of stuff uh, for the theme. And then uh, did a little hopping around at the foundry after the fact. So kind of did a girls day of it. I did not see the movie personally. I do not have a problem with seeing the movie personally. Greta Gerwig, the director, is one of the best female voices in all of cinema right now, if not the best. Uh, she's done some other movies, such as Lady Bird, for example. She's a very good actress. Uh, Noah Bambach, her partner, who I'm personally a big fan of. He kind of comes from that Wes Anderson treehouse of um, friends and associations. He uh, did a fantastic movie called Kicking and Screaming. No, not the Will Ferrell one. It's kind of a college angst type movie that I recommend folks checking out uh, where he kind of broke through. And that name might sound familiar to you, though, is specifically Squid and the Whale. Uh, More recent work, he did like a marriage story. I cannot bring myself to watch that because it's like the acting is too crazy. Like not in a bad way, but it's like good. Adam Driver, Scarlett Johansson play like a, couple whose relationships crumbling and 
the fights that they have, like it gives, kind of gives me like PTSD. I don't want to hear that. So, uh, but yeah, so Noah, Noah Bambach is one of my favorite directors too. Um, and the two of them, I can definitely tell like over the last few years as they've become partners, uh, you can see the creative influence on one another and they review each other's scripts and revise them and that sort of stuff. So I think that, I think the, if the thing that is most noticeable about their partnership is the efficiency. Like there's not a lot of fat in anything that they do and everything that they do has meaning. I think Greta Gerwig also starred, I don't recall the name of Noah Bambach's last movie, but I know her and Adam Driver again. I think they were a couple with some kids that were like traveling abroad or something. Um, that movie came out within the last year. I don't recall the name of it, but it did seem interesting enough to me. I just haven't gotten around to watching that one, but back to Greta Gerwig again, one of the most stronger female voices in cinema right now. I, Ryan Gosling, I like as an actress, Margaret Robbie, again, celebrity crushes. She'd have to be in the conversation. Great actress. And, and of course, I think most people became aware of her through Wolf of Wall Street. But obviously, if they didn't, certainly through Harley Quinn depiction, she was one of the few saving graces of that first Suicide Squad movie by David Ayers with the uh, Jared Leto Joker, kind of cringy. Um, but she was she was definitely a highlight of that. Uh, she was worth the price of admission alone, and I was happy to see her in some later depictions, the second Suicide Squad. Reboot with James Gunn, fantastic. Uh, Birds of Prey, probably top five DCEU movie. I know, I mean, I know that's not huge accolades in many sense, senses to date, but well, you know, when we're talking, you know, if you're in the last decade or so, easily top five DC movie. I would, you know, put the Snyder Cut up there. I would put, I would put the Suicide Squad, James Gunn Suicide Squad up there. I was surprisingly fond of Shazam when it came out, but I just watched it the one time. I don't know if it holds up, um, but I honestly, I expected it to be shit and it wasn't. So um, it might be a little bit extra fluff in my mind, but uh, I think man of steel gets overlooked. I did enjoy man of steel. I, it certainly had its flaws, but it's, you know, I own it. I liked it enough to, you know, get a physical copy. I, Enjoyed some of the things that they explored in that that weren't touched on or at least heavily enough in some of the older films. And I just kind of liked how they decided to approach the suit and made it look less Earth-conceived. And it made it look more like an alien suit. And, uh, I I mean, I love Russell Crowe uh, as uh, Jor-El. And so that was another plus. I love Michael Shannon and anything he's ever in, but he certainly is a crazy bad guy. So that was a good one for me. So yeah, uh, back to, I'm getting sidetracked here, but back to Barbie and the fact that Margot Robbie leads that. That's how we got on that tangent. Uh, Margot Robbie, great actress. And you could just see like the humor that's being employed in the movie, just from the trailers and stuff like that. And I got quite the dissertation on the movie from my wife, Pam. I'm going to wait to see it when it comes out. Again, nothing against it. It's just my life as a dad so limited on what I can go see at the theater. So I, uh, I'm i going to hold off on that one so I can get a copy of that and uh, watch it in the, the comforts of my own home. However, I think what a lot of people are noticing with the Barbie movie is a lot of fake outrage that's going on with that. And uh, can't say that I'm about that. So uh, I think it's mostly like neocon simpletons that are just, you know, too busy being gravitated towards um, having opinions about things that they don't know anything about, nor have they taken the time to educate themselves to knowing anything about. I mean, it's kind of like 101, the problem always. It's some person of ignorance that's not educating themselves on some topic, right? That's like most of the world's problems, right? So I did get in a bit of a discussion with somebody that I I would like to share some of that correspondence with the audience because, you know, we like to keep it real and keep it between the lanes. And I will express my reason for doing so at the close of this uh, correspondence. So my wife and I pretty sacrilegious, at least agnostic, if not atheist in our belief system. So take that for what it's worth. Write us off. If you want to right away, that's fine. Um, But, you know, I think you're just doing yourself a disservice. Uh, whenever you write people off, I don't write people off because they're Christian or of any other faith. 
I still treat them with the respect of them being human beings and allowed to have their own opinions of things. But here we go. So we uh, we follow these satirical God accounts that often poke fun at current unfortunate cultural waves, particularly as it relates to evangelicals and some of their shitty takes on things. And uh, so the God account pretty much leans into the, a lot of that sometimes. And uh, the comment was, imagine being so fragile that you take offense to a Barbie movie. Uh, that's all that God posted on Facebook specifically. And so there were some comments had this one exchange I got into specifically with somebody was, um, and I'm not going to conceal their identity, you know, for the sake of, you know, they made me not want their business known and I'll be respectful enough to, you know, play that game. Uh, there's definitely an agenda behind it. Most like most other movies these days, it's like entertainment has gone off the edge. My kids will understand masculinity and men and femininity and women and are, they're great qualities. My response, people love to unnecessarily have opinions on things that they A, didn't see themselves, or B, don't understand. I've watched plenty of Greta Gerwig's movies, and she uses satire, self-deprecating humor, which are commonly, uh, which commonly go over the heads of shallow-minded simpletons. Excuse me. I think there's a lot of fake outrage going on with this movie. Just because someone wants to use their proverbial soapbox to keep things divisive in this country, anyone who was under the impression that this was or was going to be a kid's movie is an idiot. It's a PG-13 movie to start. That decision crossed many people's desks including Mattel's, who owns the rights and the likeness of these characters. Everyone knew what they were getting into, and you're not going to get an indie darling and a strong woman's voice in cinema and entertainment without creative liberties to do the project. Therefore, Greta Gerwig. While it might be, while it might be using humor to address and point out some societal differences, for good and for bad, Understand that those rev references and themes are largely over the heads of children anyways. It would take a Neanderthal parent not to have discussions with their kids after the fact, if so warranted. So like, you know, kid ask you, oh, mommy, what did this mean? Or why'd you live at that? This is where you have that conversation. It's not a kid's movie. So anyone crying about that outrage is fake. It's fake outrage. On to the next. The response I receive. People just like being raged these days. If you're looking for a fictional movie to make traumatic, lasting impression on your children, the way that would only happen is if us as parents have not established morals, principles, and boundaries in the home and rely on entertainment to do the educating. It's really not hard to do the research. Now, I don't disagree with largely what was said in that response, but that comment at the end, it's, it's not really that hard to do the research. I'm not really sure what that is referencing because I would assume that this hot take that landed here on the social media page, this person did not actually watch the movie to begin with, which was kind of what I was speaking out to against initially. So since we got on the topic of research, that led me to go down this echo chamber, uh, this rabbit hole, if you will. And my response to that was Barbie has always been a feminist icon, secondarily, very progressive, especially recent years with societal changes and ongoings and a positive body imagery. So I, as a parent, am very attuned to this because I have daughters that are into Barbies. My oldest daughter specifically had an entire years of Barbie phases and a Barbie dream house. And my, my wife lived vicariously through her wants and ambitions for these things because she is a young girl wanted all these same things and could not afford them. I mean, she had some, but she didn't have like to the nines, what we got for our daughter, you know, and, and she gladly and willingly provided these things for our daughter, as did I, I want my kids to have things that I was not fortunate enough to have as, as a child. So, um, you know, we're very in tune with what's going on with present day Barbie. So like, if you go to the store, you'll find, uh, Barbie with psoriasis, for example, or like uh, plus size Barbie or, you know, whatever, you know, PC terminologies 
you guys kind of get the picture, but you know, there's, there's Barbie with, uh, there's a bald Barbie. There's Barbies that are dark complected versus uh, lighter complected Barbies, you know, across multiple genres. There's, uh, you know, just anything you can dream of, there is, uh, regardless of hair color, skin tone, body type, so on. There's all these types of Barbies. Okay. So back to my response. So I said, yeah, no research in most cases. Uh, I'm noticing that a lot of these hot takes are, and this is where it gets a little uh, dicey. So uh, stick with me because these are kind of jagged takes. Uh, I said, either A, it's coming from a bunch of asshole men struggling to find their own masculinity that are likely cucks anyways. Women who act like their roles are strictly for the kitchen, but realistically are just too lazy in most cases and want to hold on traditional nuclear vision of the family so they can fuck around on social media all day and send thirst traps out so they get some type of meaning or validation for their meaningless existence. And, or it's option B, and that's religious fueled in ignorance or intolerance. And I guess really there should, I should have said it option C because it could be a mixture of all of these things, which there's definitely an element of that too. So none of these things though are acceptable. And I, you know, the reason that I bring this discussion up and this correspondence up, because I know everybody's having these conversations right now. And I think it's important to like snuff out ignorance. You know, I think we need to set examples for our children and the younger generations that it, it's okay to not be okay. I think it's, it's okay to be different. It's okay to think independently. It's okay to have difficult discussions. And, you know, I think that a lot of us, there's a lot of the world that it's, it's moving so fast. And I'm not saying this is a good example, but, or a good reason, I should say that the move, the world's moving so fast that people feel like they don't need to even take the time. You know, they, they can just side skirt issues. And, how progress happens is when people sit down and have real conversations. And I think that that conversation specifically um, that is being generated from this entertainment talk of all things, things that a lot of people say don't matter. You know, they talk out both sides out of their mouth. They get all bent out of shape about all of the liberal people on TV telling them how to live, how to vote. Uh, but then they'll go watch their movies and then they'll have a shitty take on their movies and the voice of the day. Well, stop giving them your money then if you got a real problem with them. You know, there's a lot of talking out on both sides of the mouth, a lot of hypocrisy, and that's nothing new. And, and those of us with any sense know that and see that. But I like to have these conversations on this platform specifically to let people know that there is sane voices out there. There are people that still think with common sense. If you might be in the minority, uh, I like to consider us the lingo of my old, my old, uh, hero and present day still yet current wrestler the voice of the voiceless cm punk kind of his moniker we try to be the voice of the voiceless here on this podcast like while we might have opinions and takes that might side with the masses in some cases i like to consider us people that think outside of the box and yes i can see the fact that i did not watch the movie but i have a more educated opinion of barbie because I was literally told about the damn movie almost beat for beat and then all the fake outrage that's coming out about it from my wife who saw the movie who obviously went in with some expectation that she would enjoy it. But, you know, there is an element of that though. Like people that don't understand certain types of humor feel like they're being degraded and they're being called stupid and people like really get offended by that. But I'm, I'm not here to tell you right now. I don't know everything. I probably make myself look like a complete ass on this podcast very routinely. And so be it, you know, that's kind of like the cross that I bear. Notice that play on words. Uh, but no, like seriously, I, I know putting yourself out there, you're just like enlarging the target for people to say shit about you. And that's, and that's fine. And people are going to have their opinions. Here's the thing. I don't give a fuck what you think about me. I don't, I don't care. You can hate me. I'm not here to be everybody's best friend. I'm doing this because I want to be a voice for people that are in the minority. I want to spotlight uh, artists and people that are giving it their all out there in the workforce, um, whether that's through the arts or as a small business, a mom and pop that are really just trying to pursue passions, their love, trying to live their life that they want to live. And uh, 
that's the only reason that I'm doing this. I forget. I mean, there's no money behind this. This is a passion project. Um, and, you know, that's the type of people we try to bring on board. It's not to say there's anything wrong with being successful. I want everybody to be successful. That's the whole point of this. But the the MO of this show is to, A, be a voice of the voiceless, and B, spotlight some people that we feel like need that spotlight. And uh, some of the, from time to time, of course, as you know, is us going to be talking out and speaking out against some social issues. So I think that uh, that's all I'm going to have for you guys on the open this week, just because I, I find that to be just as important as any other conversation going on in this country. Yeah, there's a lot of socioeconomic and political issues going on and this, that, the other thing, but that's kind of the same old hat. There's some sports news out there. Uh, and of course, you know, we like to have those discussions on social media too. Like we're big STL guys, but I don't think there's any more important conversation right now than the combatants of ignorance because it just stretches apart across so many topics. We can get back into politics. We can get to, into the political climate of the world, socio uh, foreign affairs, you know, socioeconomic issues, you know, it all goes back to that. And I think our guest today, circling back into that, Jay Coast, I think just as music, some of the elements that you see, the infusion of multiple things and getting to know him is going to fit that lane very nicely. So I'm going to hand things off to my discussion with Jay Coast. Be sure to stick around after the break. Jay Coast, we uh, actually first stumbled upon him and at the Pump Rock Flea Market, I was uh, relatively unaware of him and what a treat because uh, I was telling him before we got on the call today uh, that I heard his music at a distance a couple bars in. I said, oh, shit, boys, I got to go check this out. So I busted out the cell phone, started recording some videos, and uh, then I kind of got started following you on social media and saw the new album getting ready to come out, Midnight Zone. And once that dropped, you know, that thing was on repeat for a minute for me. I really enjoy your music, Jay. Appreciate that, man. I really appreciate that. Thank you for yeah, absolutely. Our pleasure, without question. And uh, I just kind of want to start the conversation off. Uh, are you a St. Louis native? Have you lived in St. Louis all your life? Or just kind of give me some yeah, time? pretty much. Like, pretty much. Uh, you know, I was born in uh, East St. Louis and traveled back and forth from East St. Louis, Illinois, and St. Louis. So you can basically say I'm born in both. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just right across the river, right? So it's just yeah. a few degrees of separation, without question. Yeah. So, uh, kind of living in the St. Louis area, I'm sure you kind of went through some of the St. Louis rap booms and things like that historically. Uh, just out of curiosity, I just kind of want to know kind of what was the start of your inspiration or interest in R&B, rap, music, hip-hop, kind of what was kind of some early artists that you really gravitated towards? Well, originally growing up, you know what I'm saying, uh, my dad, he was, a, he was a reggae artist out here, and cool. uh, I was growing up, I had to be in a family band playing with him. I play keyboards and stuff like that. Nice. And then uh, that just sparked my music interest in general. And like during like middle school time, my brother got at Phil's studio and started making beats and shit. And uh, he started doing the, like, we would always listen to rap music. My dad would play rap music and listen to it. And like be working at like Bennett's Bottle. So I was always around that stuff. But then my brother would make beats, and then that got me into the freestyling game and into the trying to record and make music shit. Hell yeah. Yeah, FL Studios, that, that that's definitely a call out there, man. I remember whenever we first started getting those FL Studios when I was younger. And, uh, you know, in our in between having bands, we would all try to make beats and stuff in uh, my, my friend group. Uh, we had a pretty uh, popular R&B artist from – I'm originally from St. Louis, but my family moved down post-flood of 93 because we lost our house. So I was like in kindergarten when this all happened, but uh, we moved down to uh, a town south of there called Ironton and a really good friend of mine through school, Brian Jones, um, Jesus Rose now, he's out on the West Coast. He is now an R&B artist himself and uh, okay. we used to noodle around and, and make beats and stuff, but he's really doing well for himself out there now. But uh, he was one of my homeboys. He was up in St. Louis for a minute going by uh, Jones Rose or Jones Boy. Um, he opened okay. up for yeah, he opened up for uh, a few different artists up there, but primarily like Bone Thugs whenever they rolled through and stuff and played Pops. And uh, But yeah, he's doing things out on the West Coast. So kind of always been around it myself yeah. in my lifetime too. That's cool, man. And uh, yeah. people being connected with different uh, styles, different eras, uh, different times, St. Louis artistry. 
Yeah, I, I kind of grew up with my dad kind of exposing me to R&B music and rap music, too. He has, his musical interests were pretty wide. He was a huge Michael yeah. Jackson fan specifically. But, you know, even as rap started to kind of come into its own in the 80s in particular, and uh, some artists on the back end of the 80s, people like Young MC, my dad was a huge fan of. So I was kind of a Young MC head a little bit when I was younger. That was one of my favorite artists when I was a little kid. And I, I really liked Boys to Men specifically. I had boys like men, all the first uh, Boys to Men. Oh, dude. They they still slap in my opinion. <laughs> Can't go wrong, man. Anywhere I'm at, I'm turning up. I'm having a good ass time. Hell yeah, absolutely. So you kind of talked about kind of early, kind of some of your formative times and, and those sort of things. When is it that you uh, something clicked in your mind where you like, you know, hey, maybe I can do something with this outside of you know freestyle into some beats that are made. Like I can put some stuff down in the studio, or where did it kind of go to the next that's level for you? Like uh, that's just being able to. Just it connects so easily where it's like I can make a song in my head and then just write it down and then just be able to just how quickly that came to me and how like smoothly that transition was cool. And then uh, I found out one of my brother's friend actually had a recording like set up. So I would go over there and he taught me how to really record vocals and engineer and stuff like that because I didn't know how to do any of those things. And really he solidified me learning how to do it myself and things like that. Yeah. Talk to me about kind of like what the creative process is for you specifically. You know, I, I know you've got some background in some musicianship yourself, but I know you got some boys in your crew too. I think that might help out occasionally. I, I know whenever I saw you live, you had somebody manning the ones and twos for you and that sort of stuff. But are you yeah, writing Sarah, most of the stuff? Sarah is my DJ nice. now. And uh, yeah, he does a great job uh, bringing me, Keeping me with the energy that I need to make a good performance, and uh, I create a process usually just consists of well, how I'm feeling that day. You know, and I'm not that type of person that's like they have to write about a certain topic. I just go off the head, and whatever comes out first, I just go with pretty much. I mean, you have to walk, write, write and do things that you're kind of inspired by. And I think that's kind of the best thing, uh, you know, in a lot of cases is just kind of speak what's on your mind in, in that moment. Uh, you know, if people try to drum stuff out of the air, you know, I, you know, creativity doesn't come as easily, for sure. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing to try to, you know what I'm saying, to solidify those things. I muster up what I can in my brain to make body of art. Yeah, without question. And you kind of, you know, mentioned some of your eclectic experiences too earlier, which I think is conveyed in your music specifically, because I don't think you necessarily stick to one genre or subgenre. Uh, there's a little bit of hip hop, oh, yeah, a little no. bit of rap, a little bit of R&B and what you have going on as well. Is that something you kind of always said, like, yeah. this is what, I'm going to have to be this way if I'm going to do this thing? Yeah, like, because... I don't like to stay in one genre or stay in one like body of music just because I know I can do so much and there's different vibes that I go through and different type of music that I was brought up on and also still listening to, like jazz, funk, and those types of uh, instances. And I just feel like if people just take what they were brought up on and put it inside their creativity process, it will always be like a different vibe. Definitely. I think so one thing I do. One thing I look at too, specifically when it comes to anything in that in that lane, any well, honestly, any genre of music, and that is, what's the Im instrumentation like? You know, how are you? What are things looking like behind the scenes, behind the vocals, that sort of thing? One thing that drew me right away when I mentioned to you earlier, you know, within the first few bars, even it just outside of your vocals, was the arrangements that you were rapping over. That there was a lot of you know what I call real music being implemented behind uh, what yeah. you were presenting too. And uh, that's always attractive to me, for sure. Are you laying down, are you getting samples? Are you laying down tracks yourself? Kind of, how is that formula coming together? We mix things, like, we work on yeah. doing samples. Also, like, Pharaoh, DJ Pharaoh, he's a producer. And we'll work around getting samples and go through, like, stuff like that. And then we uh, also, a lot of instrumentation, like, tracks where it's, like, you get friends doing guitar over it. Get a friend doing a horn section over some stuff and just getting it done. My main thing that grooves me is that if I get into the groove, is the bass. If the bass is right, that's the main thing that pushes me to start writing bars. Yeah, that low end does a lot for 
any any band, but uh, definitely in in that genre as well. Uh, yeah, I know you mentioned that you're playing keys and stuff in the past. Are you laying down keys on your albums as well? Oh yeah, I had a little synthesizer from time to time. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Are, are you partial to any certain synthesizing sounds or patches or anything like that? Just out of curiosity. No, not 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 necessarily. You know, what I'm saying growing yeah. up listening to uh, a lot of West Coast rap. I like those like high pitchy ass uh, synthesizers and uh, yeah. things like that. The Dr. Dre's S synthesizers and things like right. that. Yeah, I also have uh, oddly a, a fondness sometimes for like the old school Casio sound. Uh, you yeah. know, I mean, present day Casios aren't necessarily the same thing, but you know, back eighties, uh, nineties. Casio. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I mean. Go for it. Casio make watches; they make it all. You know? Sure, yeah, they kind of multiple hats for sure, without question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, would you say that you draw inspiration uh, from you know personal life events whenever you are formulating some of your lyrics and and that sort of thing, or where are you kind of draw yeah. some of that inspiration from those themes? Most definitely, there's a lot of things that happen, you know, in your life, and I feel like you need to write about it. It's a type of therapy that you. And go through and it makes you feel better so yeah i write a, a lot about things that happen in my life and you know uh most of my albums well the collection of albums like surface level ocean midnight zone they are connected in sense, and they're all connected from like past relationships so there's that I'm like yeah male Taylor swift I hear you. <laughs> well, that, hey, man, it gets easy to write about those things, right? Because it gives a lot of inspiration to that question. Yeah, I uh, I know it's several different things, you know, uh, lyrically, but, you know, there are some of the things that traditionally that you hear in rap music, kind of the party vibe, a uh, lyrically theme, um, you know, maybe a little man slut, man slut and talk out there on a track, you know, oh, just having a little fun. Um, yeah. But, you know, you do actually talk about, you know, heartbreak and disappointment and things like that, too. So it's like, it's a Neapolitan ice cream, if you will, of, uh, you know, subject matters. You know, it's not just some guy trying to act hard the whole time and not showing you. Well, you gotta go the like, it's okay to be not okay. Yeah, I you agree. Know, like, like, for your feelings and talk about your feelings. And people feel like that's a problem sometimes. Like, you always got to put on a stunt to, like, be hard and all these things. Like, right. half these people out here talk about their subject matters, like, being and all that thing, and being grew up in the suburbs, it don't make sense to me. Right. Like, I, I grew up in a very rural place. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think about love and shit. I love good vibes. Yeah, I understand that 100%. And uh, kind of a conversation I had with somebody recently here on the podcast, too. And I think it's another challenge that a lot of young men, particularly in our generation's faces, like this, there's this feeling like you need to be like, machismo and masculine at all times and like you can't have those sorts of feelings at least publicly or outwardly to like where other people like it's some resignation of your manhood if you know if you cry or you get upset or you know those things which you know it's not the case man this is a bunch of bullshit you know just be comfortable yeah. in your own skin and, and be a real person you know be and yourself and people gravitate towards that even more when you be absolutely. yourself yeah, be an authentic human being. I think it goes a long way. That's one thing I want to commend you on too. Is I noticed that, you know, outside of some of the themes in your lyrics and stuff that we've already talked about, is the fact that you actually put posts up advocating mental health. You've done some, you know, nominal fundraisers and things like that on your social media too, which I think is badass, quite frankly. So props to you. Oh, thank you, man. I mean, I don't deserve any problems with me being myself and just helping out people like. That's the need. I, I just feel like, you know, the brand and the heart, they talk, so they, they, they go coincide with each other. So it just feels like if you're not okay up there, you're not going to be healthy with your heart. So if yeah. people need something to talk to or anybody needs to, some, somebody to just like listen, I'm, I'm always there for anyone. I don't care if they're just a stranger. Yeah, well, I again, you know, it's it's kind of rare to see. I mean, the access today, there's a little bit of everything out there, but uh, I think there's a genuineness to what you're doing too, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not that common specifically in the rap game or hip-hop game to see somebody being so open 
Uh, so props yeah. to you too. I feel like Mac was a good push for that, Mac Villa. Definitely. And uh, he definitely talked about his mental health and his, uh, and his artistry a lot. And just listening to him growing up just pushed me in a way to just be like, I should do the same because I feel these things, I've gone through these things similar and I relate to you. So I feel like if I have the means to be able to make music and do the same thing and have people relate to me, why don't I do that? Absolutely. I agree 100%. Another big uh, rapper that I like a lot, Earl Sweatshirt, he's very open about his mental health struggles, and he's always talking about that stuff, too. And, uh, you know, it's refreshing to see that there's a trend starting to more openly talk about those things, because, I mean, other genres of music do it. It's like, you know, we're all real human beings, and we have these feelings and emotions. What's what's the controversy to talk about it? So another thing that I noticed, too, with you, J Coast, is the fact that you actually perform at places that are not traditional or what people would necessarily expect of a hip-hop artist, too. You know, a lot of hip-hop artists, people just assume them that they're going to go play at a club somewhere, uh, you know, or something like that. But I've seen you play places like the Sinkhole, for example, like a punk rock venue, which is fucking yeah. hard-ass to me, man. Uh, I thought that was dope man, as hell. Where, like, they pushed me to get my start and stuff like that. So. We definitely love the thing. I know you just went, I uh, just played there in the last uh, month or so ago, I want to say. How was how was that show? How was the turnout? It was dope. It was a good turnout, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, on a weekday, you never know how many people have come through. And right. surprisingly, it was a lot of people for a Tuesday, so I was very grateful. Very cool, yeah. I'm always kind of worried about that stuff myself. I just went to a show at Sinkhole last Sunday night, and I was like... I don't think anybody's going to show up. Even Showtime started. There was only maybe like 10 people there. And I was like, oh, yeah. man, I'm feeling bad for these bands and stuff. And then all of a sudden, they packed the house out by like... They come you know, in, through. bro. Like, it's, yeah. it's like you blink and then they're there. Right. I, that's exactly what that's it seemed like. On there, uh, August 19th. So there's that. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And for sure, we're going to be promoting to, of course, post our interview today, any type of upcoming events and things that you have going across our social media specifically. And uh, we do utilize, we have a group on Facebook. It's called the ATI podcast community where our alumni can stay connected with the audience, just post like show flyers and updates and stuff in there too. So they don't forget about our folks that we had on our show before uh, as well. And uh, we will, of course, for anybody that's watching us on the live stream today, have all of Jayco's information, URLs, and all that stuff in the fun episode details whenever we go to do our episode drops, the on-demand versions, whether that's audio or video on YouTube specifically. And I know that uh, you're kind of everywhere, Jayco. So let's talk about some of the places that people can check out your music. Uh, I know that you're on Spotify. We kind of already mentioned that earlier. Uh, you're on, I believe you have your own YouTube channel, right? Yeah, I got my own YouTube channel. I have, uh, you know, like all the... Streaming platforms, title, and or uh, uh, do you, music, and uh, music, all those things. Do you have a Bandcamp site by chance? No, I do not, and that's the problem. I need to get that. Yeah, you definitely do. Uh, a lot of independent artists get discovered that way nowadays too. Um, yeah, I have, like, I, I've been I've been hip on it through through like some sources of friends and stuff like that, but like and nobody really pushed me. Like I've really been sat down to be able to set it up it gets overlooked uh in the hip-hop community but it is a huge marketing agent because i can speak to like uh, my friends across other genres of music that they're in and bands that they're in but they uh they've gotten like occasionally been fortunate enough to be put on like a special curated playlist that Bandcamp will do and their popularity mm-hmm. skyrockets anytime that that they get those opportunities so like if you get picked up as an independent rapping artist on just some, one of these guys' playlists man like it does a world of good for you and uh, your exposure, like internationally even. So yeah, I highly recommend it. It's a big marketing tool for sure. Only takes a few minutes to set up, so can't encourage you enough to do it. (laughs) So let's, uh, let's talk about some of the uh, cool show opportunities and things that you've had in the past. Uh, What are some of your more favorite performances recently and opportunities that you had well, 
hanging in tight there. You got a little bit of a signal drop. In case you can still hear me, Jay Colin, anybody that's live. Or Jay Coast, you still there? Oh, all right. Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, okay, gotcha. You're back with me. Oh, right, you good? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we're good. So I think you started detailing some of the show opportunities you had in the past and we lost you there briefly. Oh, yeah, the show opportunities. Uh, like, I've, I've, I've done uh, shows that, like, Pop Up Flea Market was a good opportunity and stuff like that. And uh, uh, vibes like those. And recently I performed out of Miami at, like, a mansion. That was a really cool nice. thing to be a part of. Very cool. I really enjoyed that. Hi, man, I bet. Uh, so, yeah, like the punk rock flea market, did you notice a lot of um, people reaching out to you after the fact or people following you? Because, you know, it's pretty ambitious to come to punk rock flea market as an R&B artist and perform. Uh, but I, yeah. I think you were well-received. Yeah, I was well-received. The, the punk community is, is a had my back since they first saw me. Like, that's the squad put me on one time as a uh, rap artist and after that the way that the whole community received me was very loving and caring and they just continued to do it that's why we continue to do it everybody was like oh yeah like they would like announce the show and be like is jayco's gonna be on it and, like in the comments and stuff like that that's why now when like basketball have a show and then they add me on it they always say the legendary because like Apparently, I'm a legend in the punk community as a rapper. <laughs> That's great, man. Well, the punk community is a pretty receptive and open community, so I'm glad to hear that that's, uh, you know, validated. And Yeah. Uh, I, I just personally have a, a, a wide eclectic music taste specifically, so it's, you know, rap music's just been something that's always been in my life to some extent. And, uh, of course, it's probably like the most popular genre nowadays in most senses you know if you're looking at your highest plays on spotify the people that are in the billions are your rap and r&b artists specifically so but sure. uh but you know man i just can't encourage folks to check your music out enough i know that um a lot of hard work goes behind to what i'm hearing because there's a lot of talent in there I, again the musical arrangements i can't pump up enough really enjoy those personally uh, as well as yeah. the rapping, you know, I, I think post your performance there at the uh, punk rock flea market, I, I mentioned specifically, you know, I really enjoyed your flow and your enunciation and uh, your vocabulary, your vernacular that you use in your rap as well. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of upstarts in the St. Louis area and some people think just because they can throw a beat on and, and get up and, and kind of work the crowd a little bit that they've got something. But you, you're really striking some lightning in the bottle with what you're doing, I believe. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. One hundred percent, dude. Just spent the truth. So yeah. I wanted to ask you a few questions about Midnight Zone. While I got you still yet here, real quickly, uh, twenty three okay. tracks on that joint, man. How the hell did you do that? Twenty three tracks on one album, uh, all at least two plus minutes long. You got some in the three minute range. Like, man, that output—that's pretty serious. Yeah, all all engineered by me, mixed and mastered by me as well. Um, very cool. I, I'm I'm just quick with laying down tracks and getting content out. So like I could be in the studio one night, and if I make one hit, I know I can make another, and I pushed out five in one night, and then I survived. So like, 23 tracks is it might seem like a lot, but to be honest, not to try to brag, it's really not much. Well, you know that's uh, it's quite the accomplishment, man. It's hard for I know I got friends and bands that've been working on albums for like five years, and they put out you know eight eight nine track album, you know, so you know twenty three tracks. That's uh, and it's you know there's not a lot of fluff there. You know, I think a lot of people they hear twenty three tracks on an R and B or rap album, they automatically assume there's a bunch of skits in there. Which, to be honest with you, I mean that was a thing in my childhood. I guess it's still yet a thing to some extent. Yeah, but it's not something I don't think you see as prominently anymore. Um, yeah. and I don't necessarily have a problem with them. I just think that they've been done to death and they're usually not good anymore. So, but uh, there's none of that going on, on midnight zone. There's no skits. These are all 100% tracks. And that's what uh, I was saying. Like, it's, no, it's like, it's, it's just flows together all well. And at the end of the day, it's good. Definitely. 
I, I mean, I've got several tracks on there that I love a lot. Uh, Midnight Zone, the title track itself, uh, caught me right away. Ben On's a fave. Uh, Righteous is a good one. Me, Myself, and I, Part 2, which folks are going to hear at the end of the uh, on-demand drop versions of this episode in full at the end of the show. Uh, Wanted, I enjoy quite a bit. Phase 2, which we used in some of the promotional ter- materials for yeah. your appearance today. Uh, Mastermind. That I'm better known in Chicago, I Hell yeah. Yeah, lot, lots of lots of bangers here, folks. Not many skips. I would I would venture to tell you no skips, in my opinion. So I really encourage folks to check this album out, at least give it a good listen from start to finish. And it's a quick listen. I know I said 23 tracks, but it uh, goes by really quick. It's an hour and seven minutes. I mean, total runtime, that's really not that much for 23 tracks. So I don't like cleaning it up. Why am I cleaning up? <laughs> hey, man, <laughs> they, we got to do you right. We got to do you right. Oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, what are some what are some tracks off of that album specifically that you feel like have uh, played really well, or uh, you've you've gotten a lot of feedback as far as favorite tracks from people? What what are some of the tracks that are standouts to you? People really do like the title track, man. Guys, um, like DJ Farrell, that's one of his favorite songs. And, uh, um, Good vibe. Good wanted, vibe. wanted, and like. Uh, Unfaithful and those 2000 s kind of vibes. Yeah, those have been really uh prominent because like that's coming back. That type of style of music is coming back in, and I'm trying to be ahead of the game and touch on it. Yeah, and uh, that weird poppy indie uh, underground R and B like me myself and I part two. Yeah, that's that's being coming in in the R&B and hip-hop era right now, so I wanted to just touch base with that, too. Very cool. Yeah, I, you mentioned kind of some of the 2000s uh, vibes that were going on, I, like some production-wise stuff. I don't know if he's an influence for you or not, but I think I hear a little bit of uh, Pharrell in some of those arrangements. Oh, he said it. He said it for real. <laughs> <laughs> That's the word. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> No, nope, that's definitely the influence right there. Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah, and another thing too, I like uh, kind of like your rhythm section specifically, your drums are a little oversaturated too when it comes to the production side. And that's kind of a, that's something for me that I always enjoy with music. And I'm just always kind of like, you know, fucking go full bore with it. You know, don't be afraid. Yep. You know, just blow, blow out those sound waves. Uh, I think you're going to grab people's attention usually whenever you're kind of going to the max like that. You want that beats or not, man? You, you want them to yeah. Hell yeah, yeah, and a lot of lot of catchy beats, um, a lot of catchy melodies, uh, arrangements on Midnight Zone. I really can't uh, encourage people enough. Um, one thing I wanted to mention too, if you guys start to follow Jacos on social media, you're going to notice um, some pretty great marketing campaigns that he and some of his <laughs> friends do sometimes. And dude, I cannot express to you enough how much I love you and Ricky Wolf. Running around on a golf course, talking shit to people. Ricky, <laughs> Ricky, like, I swear, I watched that like five times in a row. I had a good laugh out of you guys, man. Fantastic. Yeah. I was always into like Jackass, that. CKY, uh, Loiter Squad. Like that, that just reminded me of that type of stuff. It gives off that adult swim feel. And we yeah. weren't even golfing it. Like it was just random. I had a dream about doing some stupid thing like that. Woke up the next morning, told Ricky. Ricky came over, we shot the first video just in front of my house. And then, like, we we edited it, we posted it, and people fucked with it. So we said, fuck it, let's just keep doing it. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah, you guys got, like, four or five videos, I think, out there, uh, at least, of, of that type of marketing yeah. campaign for your guys' single that you guys did together. Yeah, we got a whole lot uh, coming as Dick Deshaun and uh, Johnny Sticks. Hell yeah, dude. Keep it up, because I, I think that uh, people are going to gravitate toward that stuff, especially people around our ages and that grew up with some of the things I mentioned, the CKY videos, Jackass, uh, some of the skits that were in those, and then specifically like Loader Squad, you know, the Odd Future guys and stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's hi- highly entertaining. Uh, we shared a kind of a, a uh, amalgamation of a few of them and some of the promotions up to the show, so if uh, folks are trying to figure out what we're referencing. You can start there, but I highly encourage you to go check out Jayco's social media specifically. Uh, while we're talking about him, we mentioned his name a few times in passing. Ricky Wolf, he did the performance with you there at uh, Punk Rock Flea Market. You guys have done a few tracks together. Really enjoy mm-hmm. his stuff too. Let's pump that dude up. 
Oh yeah, Ricky man, Ricky's amazing. Like just the way he uh, flows on tracks and just general. Yeah. He produces most of his music. So let me just tell y'all, hell yeah, that's a gift in itself. And to be able to know his own vibe and be his own type of person and be his own type of artist is a beautiful thing to see because it'll push you and make you feel more within yourself. And everybody just loves his general vibe because like he might be awkward, but like. That awkwardness is like very sincere and very like trusting, and I just love oh, that man. Yeah. He's himself. Oh, yeah. yeah, you guys play off of each other very well too in a live setting. I can say for sure. Uh, you know, sometimes it, you either have chemistry or you don't. I mean, quite frankly, well, and, and, and you guys definitely have that. Uh, and I like to see it, you know, translated outside of just you guys being on the stage together and you guys doing your bits. Uh, you know, with the skits too, like the comedic timing and stuff. And just, I think I hear you guys just about to break, even going back to the skits a few times on them skits, like kind of a, you know, but you guys yeah. try to stay in going the, over the like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, I, that's my type of shit without question, man. It's good stuff. Yeah. So glad to be hearing that uh, more stuff coming with him in the future too. I, I definitely think that uh, he's another very talented person and uh glad to see you guys are traveling around in the same circles uh what are some things in the works that folks can expect from you in the media in the future i know you're kind of right in the wave of midnight zone but what are some things you got coming up jay coast to let the good people know about well recently i just signed with a label uh light music group and um congrats thank you uh we've been working on just like generating more like like pushing more of the marketing way and just the development edge side of Jay Coast and just our team in general. And just to be around those people on that group, uh, shout out Baru, shout out Trio, shout out Damo, shout out Ian, shout out Mark, shout out everybody, you know, sitting on the group that just pushes me and we all push each other just to be able to collab with them and do other different styles of music. It's just, uh, it's very beautiful, you know? Oh, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, like, uh, now this label relationship that you have, I mean, obviously people hear label and mm -hmm. uh, that can mean many different things. Is this more of a distribution or are they going to help, you know, produce albums for you going forward or what's this relationship look like? It's kind of a little bit of both. You know, okay. so it's like distribution, it's like guidance, it's marketing. It's good. It's like, the, you know what I'm saying? We, we, we make tracks, they... they I send them and help out with like my, you know, what I'm saying it's like a, it's like a group to push you and help Good. you with, with key points of things. You know, what I'm saying I'll send a song. Yeah, they, it's not like they just tell you, yeah, I like it. It's like this is like they give you a full detail of everything that you need to hear to just help you in life. This is good. good. Very good. Now, since you've signed with them, have you already noticed uh, any benefits of that relationship? What, what, what? How did you contextualize what those benefits were right out the gate? Oh, of course. Just like the fact that, like, when signing with them, or but even before signing with them, we built a relationship, not just about business. It's like a, we built a whole relationship on, like, friendship and family. And that's the Good. key point to me, you know what I'm saying? And uh, it's like they actually have love for me and it's not just Good. like i'm working with them as a business you know what i'm saying right right like, they take care of me yeah i think whenever your business can be more so guided and focused toward built relationship building that's it yields the best results regardless of what your trade is uh or anything you know it's hard to be passionate uh in business dealing sometimes unless you're doing something that you love so it's easy for i would say maybe somebody from your perspective being the artist the aspiring artist and the business transaction but sometimes you know there's some predatory things that go on with labels and distributions and things like that that yeah. you know, especially young aspiring artists get caught into traps you know just because of the allure of signing with a label sometimes uh you know the wolves put on sheep clothings and and sure. uh, they guide people down the wrong type of path yeah uh, at, at, at Blank Music Group is a team of talented artists and talented people making it together. <laughs> That's oh, it. yeah. Very cool. Uh, show yeah. opportunities that you have coming up in the future where people can catch you at next uh, next appearances you have, whether it's in the St. Louis area or otherwise, that you got on the books. 
Oh, yeah. Um, well, I'll just start off with August, August 13th. Um, I'm at Ando Bar with uh, Nico and Kong, Nick, Nick at Night and Kong. And uh, uh, August 19th, I said, uh, we had Cinco. It's going to be me, Umami, and uh, Ishan Sabo and Soja, uh, Alexis. And we're just going to be like doing a lot of like different, it's like different aspects of people, you know what I'm saying? You got yeah. house music, you got vibes of like doing live band stuff too. It's just like, I wanted it to be a little different vibe. Uh, and one uh, of my favorite shows would coming up was whenever they had variety on it like that. So I think that's a good idea. I feel like if you have a variety, it still goes together. You just got to know the key points and the mixture of how you're doing it. Right. Absolutely. I agree. And then uh, the 27th, oh, like, what's this? We got a, oh, yeah, we got a show. Um, is this the 27th August? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 27 the August. I think we got a big show. Uh, the Blank Music Group is going to be throwing something big. Nice. And so, yeah, we're working on that. Sometimes oh, I don't yeah. know my schedules. <laughs> well, we're going to be sure to share those things post show, of course, and then leading up to those events so people can catch it and get those opportunities to see the live performance because I think you're really doing yourself a service going out and seeing J. Coast live and in person and living color. Um, that's you know, good. yeah, yeah. I mean, I do have a show tomorrow. Live. Well, hey, anybody that's live right now, <laughs> I got a show tomorrow. Uh, Pops with the BMG crew. Okay, cool. At Pops? Yep. Hell yeah. Yeah, Pops has been making a bit of a comeback. It got ran down there for a minute, but uh, yeah, I've caught a, I've yeah, caught a few yeah. events there in the last year or two. It's done a bit. There's so many times I've been asking on the Pops, and I was just like, no. But yeah. like, being yeah. part of this team, and right now I believe in them, and they believe in me. And if they want to just perform that pop, we perform that pop. Yeah. I mean, hey, don't get me wrong. It still gets a little squirrely at like 3 a.m. over there. But <laughs> Yeah, know. I'm not staying at 3 a.m. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend Ooh, it. No. Yeah, if you're there for a specific event, and uh, I think they're they're making a little bit of a bounce back. There's, a, there's an effort being made there. I know that they got a newer, really good sound guy there. So uh, if he's still mm-hmm. the same sound guy that's there, uh, I think you'll you'll end up enjoying it quite a bit, the experience. Okay. So, folks, uh, we have taken up about 40 minutes of the man's time here today, Jay Coast, <laughs> and I appreciate all the time that he's spent with us and uh, d- talking about his music and his background there in St. Louis specifically. I just want to hit Jay Coast with a few quick personal interest type questions just so our audience gets to know him a little bit better. Uh, if you got to take mm-hmm. a few minutes to think about some of your answers, you're more than welcome to do so, sir. I'm going to slap you with some random ones, uh, but we'll stick it, uh, stick to the music here to start things off. Uh, Let me hear. Who, who would you see, who would you put as your Mount Rushmore of MCs? So we're talking like four people, uh, MCs, who would be on that Mount Rushmore for you? Mount Rushmore of MCs, I would say Kendrick Lamar. Uh, Mac hey, Miller for me. Okay. He's good. Travis Gambino. Hell yeah. There's one more in it. My yep. Old school, new school. Snoop. Hell yeah. Yep, just yeah. vibe wise with Snoop. Dude, Doggy Style still holds up. That that debuted album, man. It's fierce. Oh, hell yeah. I, uh, funny story about that is, uh, right before COVID shut down my gym here locally, uh, I got control of the, uh, the sound system inside the gym and it was right whenever they released that remix remaster of doggy style. Uh, yeah. and I, I threw that son of a bitch on and, uh, in the whole gym and was pumping it, uh, the explicit version and, uh, somebody was, the people that ran the uh, gym were trying to find out who the fuck is putting this on. And I'm just on the road machine acting like I can't hear nothing. I'm just like, yeah, doggy style, yeah. They, whoever did this, yeah, great job, great job. <laughs> I, I say, that's a good workout. Um, I need to go oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, without question. All right, so let me get into the more uh, random aspect of these questions. Uh, let's say that there is a zombie apocalypse going down. What's going to be your weapon of choice and why? 
See, that's kind of funny. We were just talking about a zombie apocalypse. Literally yesterday, me and my office. Maybe <laughs> 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 go? you just, just close down a Walmart and hide out inside there. Um, my weapon of choice. Ah, whew. That was a tough one. Everybody always goes gun and all that stuff. I, yeah. I think if like, we went like, I want to go weird. I want to do a hot spud cannon. <laughs> hey, that'd do something, I bet. Putting <laughs> chicken potatoes right in a body's head. A hot pow! Dude, those things are pretty deadly, man. I had one when I was in high school, and uh, I got ballsy enough that I was going to let my friends shoot me with one with uh, hockey gear on. And uh, my friend's grandma, like, talked me out of it. And I'm glad that she did because then we decided to shoot it at a deer target. And it shot straight through one of those big styrofoam deer targets. So I was like, yeah, probably best I didn't take one of those to the body. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those like, things are serious. If we pennies in the buds and then it spins. Oh, damn. Oh. Yeah, you're talking some, like, buckshot type effect there. <laughs> oh, yeah, we got, yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so let's say you're trapped. Let's say you're trapped on a desert island, and you can only bring, let's say, three albums that you got to survive on on that desert album. What what three albums is J. Coast bringing? What three albums would I bring if I'm stuck on a deserted island? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm definitely bringing a Bob Marley album. I'm probably going to bring uh, it. really don't matter. Probably Bob Marley's greatest hits. <laughs> yeah, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, Michael Jackson, Thrill Album. Hell yeah. And uh, the album I didn't drop yet. <laughs> oh, there you go. Hey, I like to hear it. I like to hear that confidence. Hell yeah. Coming up big and swinging. I can finish it on the desired hour. There you go. Yeah, uh, Michael Jackson Thriller, that's an awesome album without question. Bob Marley fan as well. Can't wait to hear your new album. But um, I think Off the Wall actually gets overlooked quite a bit. Uh, I really love Off the Wall, too. I don't know Uh, why Off the Wall gets overlooked. The 80s inspired Michael Jackson. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And uh, rounded out with Bad and that decade, too, which is another great album. Um, Mm -hmm. Probably my Mm -hmm. least favorite of the three. But, uh, I mean, I would probably go with Thriller myself, too. But uh, to be honest, I would go to... with uh, Off the Wall over Thriller. I'm not gonna say about that. Yeah, uh, well, hey man, yeah, I'm not gonna look down my nose at you for that one. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'd say like I remember like as I started to listen to music and start to like like my own music was I want to say a little bit after Bad came out, um, mm-hmm. and then like you know just kind of the music video sensation of I mean it was already there before I was even born, but like. I gravitate towards a lot of like early '90s videos, so like black or white was huge whenever I was younger. As far as that music video mm-hmm. was concerned, um, there was the song. God, I feel like an idiot now. I can't remember that he did with uh, Janet. That was kind of like futuristic, where they're like playing like yeah, you know, I know it's like all ball, ball or whatever. It was like all black and white, and I loved that video. Um, I, I can be independently fan of the videos outside of the music too, but yeah, he always was kind of visionary with the video piece of things too. 100%. All right, so let's get into one of our other random questions. Uh, does pineapple belong on pizza? I'm an island boy, so I say yeah. 100%. I say yeah, too. One of my favorite yeah. toppings, man, is uh, pineapple and jalapenos, man. I like to get that sweet with that spicy. Yeah, I like that sweet and spicy. Like, that sweet and sweet sauce is just good. I don't, know. I don't understand why people got a problem with it. If you don't like it, you don't like it. Chef's kiss, one hundred percent. Hey, if you like yeah. it, eat it. I'm not that defensive about you know pizza. I've seen some crazy ass shit on some pizzas without question, and it's randomly been good. Like I get down on some pickles on pizza sometimes. That makes anything into a pizza, and yeah. like he's and he always gives it a seven out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you're kind of doing your own, like uh, me and my buddies, especially in my college days, our, our heavy party days, we would like go get the like whenever Red Baron started doing like the brick oven pizzas, like we would get okay. all kinds of shit and like doctor the fuck out of them. Like we'd make pickle pizzas, we'd make pineapple jalapeno pizzas. We, I mean, we did all kinds of shit. 
And if we was getting adventurous enough or lit enough, we would <laughs> really get wild with the toppings, like fucking mozzarella sticks and chips and shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's helping a lot. So if you had to wrap over just one instrument for the rest of your life, what instrument is that going to be and why? One instrument for the rest of my life? Yep. Saxophone. Okay. Why? Because it speaks like to the soul. You know, the jazz era was very like emotional and very just like you can put like with each breath you heard their pain. Yeah, definitely. And it's like if I if you can just hear my story through me being on a saxophone and I had to grooves together and those like wavelengths. I, I do that all the rest of my life. I don't care. That's cool. Yeah, I wouldn't have expected that answer, but saxophone, you do have a point there. Definitely, it's one of those instruments, particularly if you hear it in person. Like, I think it has a bigger impact in person versus like mm-hmm. hearing a recording of a saxophone. Like, it yeah. definitely, in the real setting, speaks to your soul, like you said. And you get it's hard not to, like, kind of get emotional, especially if somebody's getting in there with some, like, some vibrato and, and a lot of wind behind what they're doing. Um, it's one of the most, like, highly emotional instruments. Yeah. It would be pretty badass to hear somebody rap, and I don't think I've heard that too many occasions. Other, I mean, there is one that I'm aware of, but it's a very specific uh, friend doing it, so it's not the best example. <laughs> but so, like, like in a more commercial setting, I'd be curious to see and uh, see that yeah. in application. It's gonna do some uh, saxophone on a few tracks. So. Hell yeah! I look forward to hearing it. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're keeping the ambitions in line, and uh, it sounds like that you're not too afraid to get a little adventurous. I mean, anybody that listens to your music probably can draw those assumptions as it is or follows you on social media. And speaking of social media, j Coast, where's the best people to stay in touch with you and everything you got going on social media-wise? More or less, everybody can get in touch with me on my Instagram at j j a y underscore c o a s t j Coast. Hell yeah. I know you got a presence at a presence on other you know social media platforms, Facebook, uh, Twitter. I believe you might actually be on TikTok as well. But I know that you're very responsive on Instagram. Yeah, very. Yeah, Instagram is definitely my main platform that I use. I think a lot of folks, especially in the artist realm, have kind of gravitated in that direction. I know we have specifically as well. You know, uh, Facebook's kind of become a. A uh, dumping ground for like craziness. Yeah. I don't. I don't really get down with nowadays. And mm-hmm. I guess tw- Twitter's had those moments too. But uh, I don't know. I kind of like the simplicity of the interface of Twitter. So it's something I've kind of gotten accustomed to over the years. Yeah. And I almost feel like too old for TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, TikTok. Is, I was just talking about that with Fair. I was just like, TikTok is just weird to me. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the Chinese are listening to you constantly when you're on there, of course. <laughs> or so yeah. everybody tells us, right? Like, I know you're hearing me. <laughs> They're hearing us right now. I accidentally left my camera on. <laughs> no, that's cool. That's cool. But uh, I really appreciate everybody that's tuned in today with our conversation with Jacos. Jacos, thank you so much for your time. I hope that yeah, uh, we've exposed an all new audience to you and uh, looking forward to catching you at another live showing here in the future and folks catch him on one of these dates he's talked about he's everywhere and he's frequent so plenty of opportunities come see me (laughs) y'all absolutely thank you all for sticking around after the break i want to thank jay coast once again for his time today sorry for anybody that was on the live stream that kind of toughed out some of the technological issues and buffering and stuff they were having of course you know that happens from time to time uh with guests depending on what their situation is and uh, i know he's a busy guy and he's kind of out there trying to make things happen so might have not caught him at the best time but uh you know hopefully it was listenable for anybody that was on the live feed and of course the on-demand versions i think uh, everything will work out in the wash so that being said uh We're going to have those details in the episodes, of course, as we pump many times throughout the interview on where to find Jay Coast, his music. You're going to hear it in the breaks. You're going to hear at the end of the show today. You guys are going to hear that full length of a song, and that is going to be Me, Myself, and I, Part 2. You guys are going to hear that today in its full entirety, and I think it's a good display of kind of the various elements that he uses in his music and his talents, so definitely check that out. 
Be sure you guys give him a follow on social media. Very entertaining. He and his buddy, Ricky Wolf, specifically, I cannot tell you enough. Like, you know, if you're looking for some fast entertainment, check these guys out. Some of the reels that they've been putting on recently, I think they're going to be doing some more of that. So looking forward to that. Uh, Ricky Wolf, another talented guy, you know, we always like whenever people, you know, shout out their people from their crew, their boys and that sort of thing. I was love to see, love seeing Jay Coast spreading the love and, and forwarding in that love too. So you guys check him out too. Hopefully we can have him on the show eventually in the future and pump some of the stuff that Ricky's got going on too. So let's talk about what we got going on after this. So next week we're going to be doing our normal Thursday stream. I think plan is at normal time, 730 PM CST. You're going to catch us with my favorite hardcore band out of the Midwest scene, specifically St. Louis. And that is direct measure. Now you guys have heard us probably pumping some direct measure stuff. We've shared the fact that they're going on tour uh, a few months back, whenever they announced their tour announcement and the dates, we've shared some of their music on our reels and some of our hype reels for our agendas and our guest schedules and live cast schedules. We've had their music on there. So you guys have heard a lot of them up to date, maybe not even realizing that so far. So next Thursday, we're going to have them on and that is on the third. And so that is the third of August already there. And that's going to be for, episode 26 so we're going to get in mix it up with those guys talk about formation of the band inspirations you know kind of the usual chatter bit chatter bug uh but uh, then we're going to get into some specifics you know uh some random stuff get to know these guys a little bit better and uh, everything that they got in the works going forward and what to expect from them going forward i think that there is a resurgence in the hardcore scene and music in general i'm happy to see it i think it's being a little bit more commercially accepted you know when you see bands like knocked loose and turnstile headlining festivals and opening for big arena bands and stuff like that. You know, knock loose, just played Coachella, uh, turnstile is opening for blink 182 doing their entire North American tour. I think that, and they had that commercial success of course with glow on in 2001, one of my favorite albums that year, you know, those are two bands that you cannot uh, miss on in the hardcore scene right now. But I think a lot of what direct measure is, is kind of touching in the same vein um, of kind of what those bands and those movements are doing, young cats and uh, already cut cutting it. We saw them at the punk rock flea market. They were one of the most well attended and interactive uh, performances that took place there. And uh, I think that a lot of folks are going to really enjoy getting exposed to these guys, direct measures specifically, and um, to their music, to them as people. And uh, can't wait to give them the spotlight that they deserve here on our show on our platform immediately quick turnaround next friday the fourth we're going to be chopping it up with our boy zach beery so zach beery you might remember that name he was on the first season of ati podcast we had zach on to talk about uh enemy airship at that time and they had just released little cable boy and some other singles, I think Magnetic Light, we might have had an in-depth discussion about. Uh, Zach, now, that album, has been put out, finally. And it is a, I believe, eight or nine track album. I want to say nine. And that ab- album is Emperor Somehow. Just released it last Friday. Uh, already really cool reception and critical acclaim coming from these guys. Columbia Tr- Tribune covered them. Really nice article out on them. I highly recommend folks checking that out. I believe we may have shared it across one of our social media channels. Uh, but you can, of course, go to Enemy Airship's Facebook page specifically, I think, is where they shared it. And and perhaps on Instagram as well. Check that out there. Uh, Enemy Airship specifically got some play on the independent uh, KDHX affiliate or something like that in St. Louis, I want to say. And uh, they were on the playlist there here in the last couple nights i want to say so um another avenue at which people are getting exposed to their music and so i'm excited for them with that there's going to be more stuff coming i mean the album just came out it's not even been out a week uh i was lucky enough to get to see some of the behind the scenes stuff and some of the plays they're getting i mean within i i mean it was short change like 24 hours or so i think they were already hundreds and hundreds of streams um, on the new material that was just released that day. So like these guys, I cannot be excited enough for like what success is coming their way because this is, this is a feat. This album's a feat and we are going to be spending specifically next Friday, August 4th, myself waxing on 
with RJ, Rich Jackson. We're going to be doing a special for them. And we're just literally going to be covering Emperor Somehow, that album. We're going to be talking about favorite tracks, uh, the writing process, how long it took to put it all together, um, what the reception's been like already. So we're going to get in the weeds and we're just like strictly going to focus on that album. So, you know, expect maybe like a good solid 45 minutes of bangers. Talk about ins- inspirations. I'm going to talk about, you know, some things that came to my mind and listening to the album, some like, uh, and, and moments. So, and uh, I'm sure Ridge is going to be bringing that same type of stuff to the table. So we're really looking forward to being able to feature them and talk about their new album. And so that's kind of the next two things we got going on. And then uh, we'll touch base with the audience across social media and, and those platforms. we got a lot of exciting things coming up uh, following that on the agenda. We've got bands like Spotlights on uh, coming, in, coming in. Spotlights is fucking awesome. Uh, I think a lot of people are kind of aware of them. Uh, I think they're on Epicac uh, recordings, so the Mike Patton label, and um, they 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 kind of cross multiple genres. And I think a lot of people, if you haven't heard of them, are really going to enjoy them. They're kind of post metal, doomy, sludgy. Uh, you know, they kind of noise rock. You know, so it's like not out of the question to be like, okay, if you like Jesus Lizard, you might like these guys. But also, if you like something like like Failure, you might like these guys. If you like grunge music if you like soundgarden you might like these guys funny enough they've done a couple soundgarden covers which we shared on social media uh that's a part of a collective album uh spanning some of soundgarden's best work they did two covers on that black hole sun's the one that we shared specifically and really good i think they did jesus christ pose also so we're going to get into the that discussion with them and talk to them about how they kind of got that opportunity and how it came together and how they were able to make those selections. Cause I'm sure black hole sun was a major like request of people to do a very popular, if not their most popular song ever, uh, certainly in the argument or that discussion. So guys, that's what I got for you this week. Thanks for tuning in. Hopefully I kept it entertaining enough with it just being me. And I hope that you guys enjoy and, uh, I'm happy to be able to bring you guys. This is going to be a full video episode. So, Normally, we just put up the interview segments. Occasionally, we put up the full video, but uh, on this one, you're going to have the full video, and it's kind of weird talking to myself, but, uh, you know, hey, I'll get the hang of it. You know, the more I got to do it, so, but uh, hopefully, you know, kept it entertaining and spicy enough for y'all to keep locked in on my terrible vocals. Uh, so, with that being said, for this week, I am Barry Insane on Instagram and Twitter. Follow me on those social media platforms. Those are the ones I'm a little bit more active on and frequent. Uh, of course, follow the ATI podcast. We're across all social media channels. We're a little bit more responsive, a little bit more active on Instagram specifically, but all that stuff typically you ought to post to Facebook. So we do check that routinely. Uh, Instagram, we're on there. We don't get a lot of followers on there, or excuse me, not Instagram, but uh, Twitter. We don't got a lot of followers on there because I think people are starting to move away from that. We do have a Threads account now. I think I mentioned that previously. We've got TikTok and pretty up to date on everything. Uh, threads, I've not gotten into the whole motion of. Um, but we'll get on board with that eventually too. But yeah, just stay tuned to what we got going on. We try to keep you folks updated and uh, the show agenda is out there and we locked down some dates into November also since our last update on show and live cast agendas. We got some more exciting live on sites. We've got an awesome Halloween coming up with um, some surprises too outside of what we've announced. So really looking forward to doing Halloween with you guys again this year. You know us, we love our horror movies. We like getting spooky up in this bitch and uh, follow the ATI co- podcast at the ATI podcast on Instagram. Search for us on Facebook, ATI podcast. We've got a fan page, IT, ATI podcast community for our Facebook group where we got that really interactive scene going on where we we're talking into both listeners. You can talk to hosts. We're curating stuff. We're putting up uh, playlists. We're doing all kinds of things there and you can stay in touch also with former show guests. I know people like Brady from Brady's Jiu Jitsu Club, small business that we featured. Uh, he's got his own Jiu Jitsu practice where he does a lot of self-defense tactic treat uh, with like anti-bullying campaigns and stuff like that. Uh, he's been posting some promotions and stuff that he's had going on at his establishment. So, you know, utilize it folks. It's there for you two years. Um, you know, nobody's stopping you over here. So, you know, follow us across all social media platforms just to stay in touch and until next time guys good night good luck stay safe out there
Hey, this is Josh from ATI Podcast. For show updates and news about the podcast, follow us on social media. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ATI Podcast 22, on Twitter at podcast underscore ATI, on Instagram at the ATI Podcast, on TikTok at ATI Podcast. DMs are always welcome. Have a question for the show? You can always email us at ATI Podcast Questions at gmail.com. Stay safe out there. This is Barrett from the ATI Podcast. Each week, Josh and I discuss current events, pop culture, music, TV, movies, politics, sports. Nothing is out of bounds. You can also tune in to learn about rising artists, small businesses, whether it's music, graphic design, filmmaking, or even a brick-and-mortar mom-and-pop shop. We will be spotlighting folks in their endeavors. Listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Anchor, or anywhere you enjoy your podcasts. Just search ATI Podcasts. We would like to thank you for your continued support. And as always, please stay safe out there.